Welcome everyone to the first ever Public Web AI Summit. Woo! I'm Jason Mays, Web AI Lead here at Google, and I'll also be your host for today and one of your presenters. Now, I started this summit a few years ago internally to share knowledge between Googlers in this field, going from around 10 to around 1,400 of us in just two years. And after speaking to many of you at events, I heard feedback that you wanted to start something more official for everyone to be part of too. So today, in our third year, we're making the Web AI Summit public to bring together great minds working across this space from all around the world, both here at Google and also from beyond too. So what can you expect? Well, you're going to hear from a whole bunch of great presenters from over 20 teams across companies who are already using Web AI today. And my hope is that by sharing knowledge, we can accelerate the rate of innovation for AI in the JavaScript ecosystem on the client side, which is something that's been growing in usage since 2017. Now, our viewers today come from all around the world. In fact, we have over 1,000 people tuned in live with 22 countries represented, 59 cities, and 179 unique Google offices, which is really incredible and just shows how far the passion for web AI goes. And many thousands more will view today's videos on demand after the show. So hello to all of you on YouTube watching us in the future. Now then, if you're inspired by anything you see today, join the conversation on social media using the hashtag WebAI and share a clip from your favorite talk or ask a question to the community or share what you've been working on. Let's continue to grow together in this space even after the show and help each other out going forwards. Now, on that note, I'd just like to give a shout out to everyone who's helped here make this happen, from the presenters you'll see here today to all the folk behind the scenes to ensure this was a success. It really does take a village of people to put these things on, and it's been a pleasure working with every single one of you. So thank you. OK. Yeah. <clears throat> So first, let's start by formally defining what I mean by Web AI, which is a term I coined back in 2022 to stand out versus cloud-based AI systems, which were popular back then. Web AI is the art of using machine learning models running client-side in the web browser, running on your own device's processor, graphics card, or even NPU, using JavaScript and surrounding web technologies like WebAssembly, WebGPU, or emerging web standards like WebNN for acceleration. And as you'll see today from Chrome later on, in some cases, the model might even be built into the browser itself and exposed to JavaScript developers via emerging APIs for common tasks like prompting, summarization, and translation. Now, all of this is different from cloud AI, whereby in that case, the model would have to execute on the server side and be accessed by some kind of API instead which means you need an active internet connection to talk to the cloud AI at all times to provide those advanced capabilities. Now, what difference does one year make since my last talk in 2023? Well, I'm pleased to announce that we at Google crossed 1 billion cumulative downloads of MediaPipe Web and TensorFlow.js libraries and models for the first time. And I'm sure if you talk to other presenters here today, they're also seeing significant growth in usage for their libraries and models too. In fact, over the past two years alone, we've averaged 600 million downloads per year at Google, bringing us to over 1.2 billion downloads in that time. So now really is the time to get involved. But why should you care about client-side web AI? Surely you can do all of this in the cloud, right? Well, you can get some superpowers that are just not possible with a cloud infrastructure. Now, I know all of you come from different industries, so think about how any of these could apply to yours as we go through them. First up is privacy, as no data from things like the camera, microphone, or even text need to be sent to some remote AI model in the server, which protects the user's personal data. Now, a great example of this is shown here by Include Health, who will be talking later today, and they use browser-based pose estimation models to perform remote physiotherapy without sending any of the imagery to the cloud, protecting the user's privacy, allowing the patient to perform their checkup from the comfort of their own home. You also have the ability to run offline on the device itself, so you can even perform tasks in areas of low or no connectivity after the page load. Now, you might be wondering, why would a web app need to work offline? Well, in this great example by Hugo Zanini, who's also speaking later today, he performs product placement verification using a web app in supermarkets. Now, you can imagine applying similar techniques to retail analytic solutions to monitor when objects are interacted with or maybe even within digital kiosks in the aisles of these supermarkets to understand 
we're, when an area is uh, busy in different times of the day? Or what about healthcare solutions in pharmacies and much, much more for pill counting in this example, all working offline to conform with regulations? Next is low latency which can enable you to run many models in real time, and you don't have to wait for the data to be sent to the cloud and back again, which may be significant if you're on a mobile phone data connection, for example. As such, many of our models, like these ones from MediaPipe for body pose and segmentation, can run at over 120 frames per second on a mid-range laptop's GPU, with great accuracy, as you can see on this slide. Now, you've also got lower cost, as you don't need to hire and keep running expensive cloud-based graphics cards and processors, which means you can now run generative AI directly in the web browser, like this large language model on the left, without breaking the bank. In fact, MLC's talk later today, you can check that out to see how they're converting and running many LLMs directly in the browser too. And we're now seeing production-ready web apps benefit from significant cost savings, like the example shown on the right, for advanced video conferencing features, such as background blurring in the browser. And even better, you can offer frictionless experiences for your end users, as no install is required to run a web page. Just go to a link, and it just works. In fact, Adobe did that exactly here with Adobe Photoshop Web, enabling anyone anywhere to use their favorite creative features on almost any device. When it comes to the object selection tool shown on this slide, embracing the client-side machine learning for this feature can provide Adobe's users with a better user experience by eliminating cloud server latency, resulting in faster predictions and a more responsive user interface. And on that note, it means you can leverage the reach and scale of the web, which has around 6 billion browser-enabled devices potentially capable of viewing your creation. All right, so let's take a video conferencing solution as an example. But you can imagine this for other use cases that might also consume audio or video data, maybe for healthcare, security cameras, and beyond. Many of these services provide background blur or background replacement for privacy. So let's crunch some hypothetical numbers to see the value of using client-side AI at scale. First, a webcam typically produces 30 frames per second video. So assuming an average meeting is 30 minutes in length, that equates to 54,000 frames per meeting that need to have the background blurred. So assuming 1 million meetings a day for a popular service, that equates to 54 billion segmentations every single day. Now, even if we assume an ultra low cost of just 0.0001 cents per segmentation, that would still be $5.4 million a day, which is around $2 billion a year for server-side inference costs. By performing background blurring on the client side with web AI, that cost goes away. And don't forget, you can even port other advanced models to the browser, like noise cancellation, to further improve the meeting experience for your users, while reducing costs even more by running all of these features on device. But what about bringing large language models to the browser? In the example shown here, you can see how the user can generate an email to their friend for a given context and with certain requirements without any of their text being sent to the server. Even better, this runs really fast. The demo you see here is captured in real time. Now, you can imagine turning something like this into a Chrome extension, whereby you could highlight any text on the web page, right click, and convert it to a form suitable for social media or maybe to find some words you don't understand, all in just a few clicks for anything you come across, instead of needing to go to a third-party website to do so. I did that right here in this demo that I made in just a few hours on the weekend, entirely in JavaScript, client-side in the browser. There's just so many things waiting to be created here. In fact, people are already using these models to do more advanced things, like talking to your PDF documents to ask questions about their contents without having to read it all yourself, as shown in this demo by Nico Martin. This is a great time saver and a really neat use case of large language models when combined with surrounding RAG techniques. In this case, to extract the sentences from the PDF that matter and then use them as context for the LLM to answer some given question. All working locally in the browser on your device. And notice here it even shows you the sentences it generated the answer from so you can reference the actual human written knowledge which might be useful to ensure that no answer was hallucinated in the answer. Or what if your videos could watch themselves for you to extract useful frames all by themselves? I made this demo in just one day using Transformers.js, who will be talking shortly, whereby I'm able to enter a sentence for what I want to look for, such as my name in the video frame, or an image of a guy standing on a plane, which is one of my hobbies when I'm not nerding out on web AI. And sure enough, it finds those frames for me and extracts them at the bottom. 
So, from Chrome extensions that supercharge your productivity to features within the web app itself, we're at the start of a new era that can really enhance your web experience, and the time is now to start exploring those ideas. Let's head on over to the Web AI community to see what they've been up to. These are people just like you, but are already using machine learning and JavaScript in their products and services, just to give you a taste of what's possible. All right, let's roll the video. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do is build tools to allow anybody to be their true self. Um, there's a lot of people that feel uncomfortable on camera. Here's like a much more detailed side-by-side -side view of my face being captured alongside uh, the face of the 3D character. And so what's happening is it's tracking individual facial blend shapes um, mm -hmm. and then relaying them back into that Unreal Engine to uh, render them. I work as a radiologist and uh, the last four years I've been really interested in using artificial intelligence for segmentation. And this is a really nice thing with uh, TensorFlow.js, I think, is that you can interact with the AI models. It doesn't have to do fully automatic uh, predictions, but you can actually kind of guide uh, the models to get the result that you want. We're gonna see a, an animatronic talking backpack um, that uses uh, face mesh. And it was sort of an, a, a comedian in the wild experiment um, that respected social distancing. It does what you see. It, it puts all these tracking points on a face and it can track it with and without glasses. It has an incredibly high frame rate, uh, even in JavaScript and even in browser. So wouldn't it be great if you could use this technology to control animatronics? So this is an example of how Cardinal Health is using RoboFlow to improve the back rooms of pharmacies. So they have a division of their company um, that works with pharmacists where one pharmacist can manage several locations remotely over a, a video stream. And so this runs in the browser on an iPad. And previously it was just a video chat between the pharmacist and the technician. And then they used RoboFlow to add on a pill counting feature um, that helps the pharmacists uh, be augmented by the computer vision model so they don't have to count from scratch. They can um, use the model to estimate and then you know adjust up and down where the model has you know, not gotten an exact count. The video that I'd love to show here is uh, a video piece that I constructed, which I call Mirror Exercise. And this is an AI-generated duet with myself. So what you're seeing here is um, in the, the figure in black is my real motion capture data from a couple data taking sessions in the studio. And in blue, you see a dancing accompaniment that is generated by the model. So in each case, the model is seeing a certain segment of my movements and is um, creating a slight variation on it in some sense. It's a hand tracking engine called Yoha. And so what it does is it processes the uh, video feed of your webcam and it detects the location of your hand in this video feed. And the goal of it is that it allows you to quickly sketch something roughly similar to how you would do it um, on a whiteboard. Timo is a visual workflow engine that allows you to build very complex solutions in just minutes. And we do that through a drag and drop interface, which helps you uh, define any kind of process without the need for coding. So uh, this is the final version of the program. The video is a bit sped up, so things happen fast, but you can see that as water is taken out from the container, the graph reflects the changes of, uh, in the level of the liquid, liquid which, is, which is what we wanted. We wanted to go beyond machine and even beyond the clinic. And so that's really when we decided to expand our platform into computer vision and delivering care directly into patients' homes on their own devices. We're a medical device that we can run on any device fully web-based. And you can see these patients doing different exercises, upper body, lower body, with real-time feedback, counting their reps. We track their range of motion. We get, gather all that and send it back to the clinician for review to help modify their home exercise plans accordingly. All right. So some really amazing demos right there. And no matter if you're recording motion capture data to transform your users to different personas to make an experience more fun, to the latest in generative AI, we can even run diffusion models in a web browser at incredible speeds with new technologies like WebGPU that are now enabled by default in Chrome. Things are about to get really exciting with regards what we can expect from a web app of the future. 
In fact, right now, Gen AI in the browser is in its early stages. But as hardware continues to evolve with more RAM available to both CPU and GPU, we shall continue to see more models ported to run on the browser on your device, enabling businesses to reimagine what you can do on a web page, especially for industry or task specific situations. In fact, we could see smaller large language models in the two to eight billion parameter range be tuned for specific purposes and run on consumer hardware. Right now, you can envision a hybrid approach whereby if the client's machine is powerful enough, you download and run the model there, only falling back to cloud AI in times when the device is not able to run the model, which might be true for older devices. And with time though, more and more compute will be performed on device, so your return of investment should get better as time goes by when implementing an approach like this. Now then, I'd just like to end by saying there's very few opportunities in one's life to be at the beginning of a new era like this. I, for one, remember when the internet came out for the first time. Yes, I am that old. And Web AI has the same feels as that, but only magnified 100x. Now, I personally believe that in the future, we, we as web developers will build Web AI compatible websites whereby you have the option to just talk to them naturally via text or voice to perform any of the tasks that they support instead of manually figuring out some arbitrary workflow or user experience. And sites that are not AI compatible might be out of fashion pretty fast, just like when we moved from having mobile versions of our web pages as smartphones grew in popularity. So I hope in this talk, I've been able to provide you a glimpse into the future and why you should start investigating web AI today because everyone watching here has a chance of a lifetime to shape the future of this fast growing space. And I hope all of you will join me on this adventure. So do tag me in anything you make, or if you've got any suggestions for any of the technologies that I've mentioned in this talk or later today, and you can connect with me on social media using the links on this slide. I'll now hand over to Jim Bankowski, a VP on the Chrome browser, to give a few words on why web AI is important at Google. Thank you, I'll see you next time, and enjoy the show. I'm uh, Jim Bankowski, and I'm a VP at Google. Um, I work on Chrome Browser. Uh, I just want to say ditto to everything he said, so I'm, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I, the one thing I, do, I don't actually ride on tops of biplanes, which I think is what he said, but um, anyway, I'm going to talk about why Google's investing in this space. Let's start with the web. Uh, over 5 billion people use the web today. There's no sign of it slowing down. E-commerce and uh, digital ads industry is still growing by 10% over, year over year. JavaScript is the most widely used programming language in the world. 70% of professional developers use this in production. Um, obviously, AI is very hot right now. You can't, you can't spend five minutes on any media and not hear something about AI. Um, as all of you know, um, it has the potential to have a giant impact that um, brings a huge level of efficiency to every industry in the world. Um, with these, developers are clamoring for this ability and the ability to do this everywhere. Today, uh, most of it to date has been web front end, as Jason said, with a server back end. And the server, as Jason said, has uh, some downsides. Uh, it can be expensive at scale, even if you're using Google's amazing Vertex AI. <laughs> um, you have to send your data to some backend, and maybe there's privacy concerns or GDPR concerns. There's latency concerns. And of course, it doesn't work if you're not connected. Um, we're, uh, to that end, we are seeing a lot of people trying to bring it to the web directly. Uh, and we want to support them in Chrome and are obviously all off, better off if we work together on this. Uh, there's a lot of use cases. People are building agents. They're rewriting uh, text and uh, changing the tone. They're summarizing, translating, uh, making things accessible. Um, lots of great work. And at Chrome, we've been working to bring AI on device. There's sort of two flavors of that that we focus on, client-side AI and built-in AI. And I'll talk about both of those. Client side, in this case, maybe you've created a model, you've done your own training, um, or you, you uh, downloaded something awesome from uh, Hugging Face, like what Josh will talk about soon. Uh, whatever the reason, you want that, you want to bring your own model and run it on top of the web. And we built uh, with partners, uh, 
APIs like WebGPU, WebAssembly, and the uh, up and coming WebNN. The hope is that we can run them as performantly as you can run native and uh, right in your browser. So what's built in AI? This is the situation where you have a problem to solve that AI does, but it's a common problem that everybody has. We're gonna supply purpose-built models for a, common, a number of common scenarios, summarization, speech to text, translation, um, even maybe background blur and some other things. More recently, we've been building Gemini Nano into Chrome browser. That's a relatively small generative AI model to, do, to make all of these things better. Um, there are some issues with client side even. Currently, large language models need some pretty powerful machines to run. And that means, you know, some users won't have that. Uh, sometimes, even when the machine is powerful enough, we ask a lot of it. You know, if you're doing a meeting and you're doing background blur at the same time you're doing translation and summary, you suddenly run out of uh, cycles to do it. And maybe, you know, sometimes that model, we can maybe run four or eight billion parameter models locally. You want that 70 billion parameter model to solve really hard problems. So there's, there's a, a set of issues where you probably still need server. So as Jason, Jason said, a hybrid approach might be the best case for you. Um, if your device, you have a good model that works everywhere and you're happy with it, it might be the situation where you can run that same model on the server that you do on devices and half of your devices work and it's free and the other half you pay for. And over time, more people will have machines that can handle that and you will, you'll see the benefit. And you might have another situation where half of the tasks can be accomplished locally and the other half you need a server backend. So when you actually implement a hybrid thing, you're sort of um, betting on the future, which will have um, hopefully machines that are more performant and more capable, and you'll be able to take advantage of that. Um, Jason also brought up Photoshop. One thing I wanted to point out is the web in the past five years or so has come, gotten enormously more capable with a ton of new features that have made you know, f the ability to bring a, a full you know, um, native app to the web. And the web's, they, Adobe was excited about this because they wanted to hit, they wanted a distribution model that could hit everybody in the world. And they loved the accessibility, the ephemeral, ephemerality, and the ability to click, uh, link, click a link in an email that brings you right into the experience. Um, so why does Google care about this? We want our users to have the best experience. Um, and you know, to provide things like accessibility and end the ability to end repetitive tasks or provide uh, advanced features. Uh, we bre believe that bringing web apps into the AI era is something that our users are demanding. They see ML, you know, they see ML everywhere and everybody wants to, uh, to see this run. And we are starting to make these advancements available to all of you. There's, um, we're looking for feedback and usage. We've already got something like 4,500 signups to our early access program. Hopefully, you'll you'll join our Chrome, um, and ho you'll join us on our AI journey and make uh, web apps of tomorrow work. And thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the talks today. And I will pass it to Josh. Mm -hmm.